Yeah, I ran out of time at 8.30. I thought I'd better come up and pinch another minute. Isn't it great to see these young people who have graduated from Kids Church and now they're in youth group, year 6, 7 and 8. So they're fantastic. And they, uh, so guys, you've got to put up with me now. But if you like what I share, you can say to youth leaders, we want to stay in here past the bill each week and they can go up there on their own. Is that all right? I'm just teasing you. No, 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 no. I'm just teasing you. But it's great to see uh, dedicated leaders who uh, serve our junior teens, year six, seven, eights, every Sunday morning. It's fantastic. You guys are heroes. And we honoured one of them on Tuesday night, Tim Hersey. Yeah, but that was a surprise, wasn't it, Tim, wherever you are? And uh, we, we blessed him, guys and girls that serve the Lord and uh, help build the body, particularly our, our young people. The church we can be. I started the message, uh, the series uh, last week on sharing about what's at our core. And uh, uh, these messages are taken from the book that actually is now going to be at the printers sometime next week. So we may get it on time. You know, I had a bit of a doubt, but Milan Tompich works wonders. And so uh, you will buy 10 copies each and pass them on, won't you? Yes. One copy? Okay. Um, so I'm sharing bits and pieces from the book, and you would need to actually read the whole thing to pick up the heartbeat of what I believe at a profound level about Jesus Church. Uh, the me I can be is about what I believe about the gospel of Jesus and how he can change any person and transform them, as I've seen over uh, 47 years. The church I can be flows out of the fact that I've only ever been in two churches all my life, the one I got saved in and this one here. And uh, I love the church of Jesus Christ. I, I cannot imagine, well, it's just almost impossible to do, to do spiritual life without being connected to a group of people. Uh, there's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. Someone who says, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ follower, but church, no, no, don't like that. Hey? It's like saying, it's like I'm a bridegroom. I love the bridegroom, but I don't love the bride. Um, impossible. I love the head, but don't love the body. And so uh, you just can't function as a Christian. You can't grow and develop unless you are intimately connected. Um, and so last week I shared what's at our core. I talked about the scripture, our guiding compass. It guides us. God's word guides us. And uh, we need a guide. We need an authority. And, and God has given us the Old and New Testaments, and they guide us as a church, the Christian Family Centre. Our true north is always Jesus Christ. Everything we think, say, and do endeavours to point people to him. To, to, he is the head of the church. And it's he who we want to, to, to be seen. So when we produce disciples, we don't say become our disciples. And in the book I share about a heresy that used to come in called the discipleship teaching that said, you know, to become a disciple, you've got to be a disciple of a person, a disciple of a church, a disciple of a leader. And it was, it was wrong. We, we believe in discipleship, but disciples of Jesus. So our task is to point you to him and to come under his authority, not under a man-made authority. He's our boss. He's our leader. He's our governor. He's our director. He's our true north. And uh, he is perfectly good and gracious and kind. And in leading us according to the word, so the scripture is our guiding compass, Jesus is our true north, and the Father's heart, his love for all people, is what's at our core as a church. If you, want, if you scratch us... We bleed these things. The, the, our God encompasses the scriptures. Our true north is Jesus. The Father's love for all people. That's why we say we're a church for all people. That all can come to a knowledge of Christ and be saved. This week I want to share on the life together. It's a great little phrase that comes from Eugene Peterson's uh, translation of, of the New Testament and a, a portion of scripture we're going to read today. The life together. Here's a question. What kind of church can we be? See if you can answer this in your own heart. What kind of church can we be if we cooperate with our Father in heaven and allow him to shape us as he wants? Wow. To allow him to shape us individually and corporately as he wants. But of course, what's the model? What's 
What's the pattern? The pattern is in Acts chapter 2. Dr. Luke gives us a brilliant description of the first church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. This passage of scripture was riveted to me when I was probably about 18 or 19 years of age. I got saved as a 17-year-old and was thrust into, in my 18th year, when I failed year 12, which I don't recommend. I actually failed year 11 and I failed year 12, kids. I was naughty, didn't listen to my parents, rebellious against my teachers, and, uh, and so I spent seven years in high school. Can you believe that? He's saying, Bill, you're, how can such an intelligent young boy spend seven years in high school? Because I was lazy and didn't listen to my parents and disobeyed the teachers and played hooky or wagged, you know what that means, that's old terms, you know. Did other things that I shouldn't have been doing. Anyway, I got saved in year 12. And, uh, but I failed that year, 1971. And I came back and somehow God used that in an amazing way and we saw a significant move of the Holy Spirit, a, a movement among youth, all years, years 7 through to year 12, parents, teachers, and the school was turned upside down. In fact, the school was turned the right side up because so many came to Christ. And I, I, I just fell in love with, with uh, that. At the end of it, I'm, I'm 18, and I think, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I could just spend the rest of my life watching Jesus do that stuff, saving people, getting them filled with the Holy Spirit, bodies being healed, evil spirits being cast out of people that were involved in the occult. Uh, we had about 30 young people get baptised in water, get this, in the middle of winter at the end of Henley Beach Road. Right, go right at Henley Beach Road. It was raining, it was freezing cold, and they wanted to get baptised in water straight away. We've got it so easy today. Nice warm water over here at your convenience. I think to be a radical disciple, you've got to be in the middle of winter when it's cold. So we're baptising all these kids, and there was one young guy. He got saved two days beforehand. And he said, I want to be baptised. I said, well, well, we need to, to prepare you. Before I knew it, he stripped off to almost nothing. And I'm going like this. All the girls are going, oh, no. So I said, quick, get in the water. So he ran into the water, and we baptised him as well. And I've got a photo of it, if you don't believe me. It's, uh, it'll be a rated photo. <laughs> but what I appreciate about him, and he's still going on with God, is the enthusiasm, the fire in his belly. So I saw all that. And uh, thought, man, I, I could do this the rest of my life. And so it was soul winning, evangelism, reaching people with the good news about Jesus, that he loves us, that he died for us, that he rose for us, that we can have a relationship with God, that our sins can be cancelled out, that there can be a new start to life. That gripped me. And so that side was, was pretty on fire. I went to a youth camp that we used to run, or the, the church used to run, at Tatachilla. Uh, Lutheran campsite down at McLaren Vale and there would have been maybe 300, 350 young people uh, from all over South Australia that would come and, and the CRC, our denominational family would run it uh, from the Sturt Street Church and, and so I went there and I forget what year it was, it might have been when I was 1972, 73 but an Indian pastor named Rasik Rancord and uh, we had Rasik come here a couple of years ago, he's an older man now he was our guest speaker and he shared a message or a series of messages that rocked my socks. It, it just, it, it affected me profoundly because I was strong on the evangelism side and reaching and mission and touching people, but Russick painted a picture of what the ideal church is and he used the Acts, Acts 2 passage and he opened it up and it was like Jesus was speaking to me and from that point on, that passage of scripture, Acts chapter 2, the Acts 2 church, was, was riveted into my heart as being the ideal and I've lived in it and I've explored it and done a whole stack of notes and preached in camps on, on uh, what the ideal church should be, the church that we can be. And I've never forgotten and I've always honoured Rusick. He, he forgot about, I said, Rusick, you, your message, one message helped transform my life as a young guy. And because uh, God then balanced my life and said, you know what, the church separate from evangelism, evangelism separate from the church doesn't work. And I'm so pleased because 
all those young people that we led to Christ in, in uh, Underdale High School, for so, uh, I just wanted to find churches for them because I couldn't look after them. So there was a little Assemblies of God church at, uh, uh, down the road. There was uh, other churches. There was a, and I, I couldn't get them all into the city. So I spoke to the pastor. I said, these kids are coming to Christ. They live near you. Can you look after them? And I found that those that connected to those churches grew in Christ. Those who didn't connect to the church, there was a high level of recidivism. They didn't last. And so I accidentally found that truth. But then with Russick sharing, I've realized and I've seen where evangelism and mission occurs separate to the life of the church. Worship on Sundays, preaching of the word, discipleship, fellowship, connection, correction. Uh, there's a high level of recidivism. People don't, don't, don't last. And I've seen mission occur separate to the church and, and very few people actually last. It, they can, obviously, but when, when mission and evangelism occurs as part of the life of the church, then those new converts are, some, are able to get embedded into the life of the church. And I've never seen it work outside. I'll actually put that in, in the book and say, because there's a lot of theories out there. You know, you get theoreticians who've never done it, and they think they've got an answer, and they separate mission from church, and they think almost like they're anti the church. And, I say, well, how can you be, love Jesus and hate his bride? It's impossible. How can you have a chip on your shoulder about the church? Oh, because I've been hurt or because there's... I think, well, that's just life. Name me a family where some member of your family doesn't hurt you. Who has the perfect family here? A mum, a dad, a brother, a sister, an uncle has never hurt you. Perfect family, sinless. No such animal. That's life. And you've got to move on. You've got to forgive. Don't have to agree with them, don't have to trust them, but you've got to move on and realize family is part of God's plan and purpose, relationship. Same as a church. A church is made up of, of people that are forgiven. They're not perfect. They're pilgrims on a journey. This is a hospital for sinners. And I'm the chief of sinners. And I'm so thankful the church accepted me as I was, with all my imperfections. And so the church is his bride, it's his body, it's his army. And so uh, to, to grow properly, we need to be so, so connected. And I, I found that uh, what Russick sowed into my life back in those early years was, has been instrumental in helping me un understand and see things. So Dr. Luke, he gives us a brilliant description of the first church in Acts chapter 2. In this passage, he tells us what real Christian community looks like, the life together. And it helps us practically assess our own spiritual health. I have used this passage to continually assess my own spiritual health and the health of the Christian Family Center. It's become the number one diagnostic tool. So it hasn't been a book on church health and church, it's actually been what Dr. Luke describes in Acts chapter two has been the tool that God has given me to help assess where I'm at in my walk with Jesus and how we are walking together as a community. And uh, I love this passage. And so he starts off by telling us that there is a new beginning for people. And he talks about the three steps to our new beginning in Christ. Let's read uh, from the message, Acts chapter 2, verses 39 to 42. Peter said, change your life. Turn to God. Be baptized, each of you, baptized in water, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is targeted to you and your children, but also to all who are far away, whomever, in fact, our master God invites. He went on in, in this vein for a long time. This is a great encouragement to me for long-winded preachers. This is really good. So I have authority to go over time. He went on this vein for a long time, urging them over and over, get out while you can, get out of this sick and stupid culture. He's not saying detach yourself from the world. He says, identify those things that are anti-Christ, anti-Scripture. Be engaged with the world, but disassociate from those things that will drag you down. So he says, get out while you can. Get out of the sick and stupid culture. That day, about 3,000 took him at his word, were baptised and were signed up. Folks, we see here repentance, water baptism, and baptism in the Holy Spirit are the important first steps to the Christian life. It's a new beginning. It's all about turning our lives over to Jesus 
and his control and publicly demonstrating that we have been adopted into his family. Now, these steps help to, to, to us to become firm in our faith and securely planted in Jesus' kingdom. And church, this is so basic, but you, if this hasn't taken place upon your entry point into the new life you have in Christ, you will never be firm in your faith. You'll never be fully secured. So salvation, coming into the kingdom, changing our mindset. And so we are continually to have a change of mindset, to say, well, I'm wrong, he's right. I turn from my sins, I put my trust in him. I seal it with water baptism, because that decision may be private, but water baptism is public, where I, flag, where I fly the flag high and say, I'm following Jesus, and then getting baptized in the Holy Spirit with the gift of being able to speak in a brand new heavenly language to help me be empowered to live the Christian life and to be a witness to the world. These are foundational. And, and without them, you can't really get firm in your faith. These are beginning steps. If you have received Christ and you haven't been baptized in water, you're missing out. This is part of the Christian initiation. You can be a Christian without being baptized in water. You can be a Christian without being baptized in the Holy Spirit and the gift of speaking in tongues. But to fully appropriate your adoption into his family, all three are necessary. And Dr. Luke says this is what they did, 3,000 of them believed on that very first day. Secondly, a new devotion. In verse 44, he lists four indispensable devotional habits that are necessary if we're to grow in our faith and remain passionately on fire for Jesus. Acts 2.42 says, they committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles the life together, I told you that's where the title of this message comes from, from Eugene Peterson, the common meal and the prayers, the teaching of the apostles, listening, coming under the preaching of the word so that it ministers to one's soul, and that means a submitting to those who are called to preach and minister that word. That's what they did. They developed that habit to say, we want to sit under teachers and preachers who are called to communicate God's message and to be nurtured in our understanding of, of the things of God. The teaching of the apostles, the life together. That word is the word fellowship, where the Greek word is skinonia. Now, Anglos say koinonia when they read it. You know, if you do... New Testament, koinonia. Ah, forget this koinonia business. It's kinonia. Do you want to say it with me? Kinonia. All the Greeks said, preach it, Bill, give us the right language. And that word's a fantastic word. When, when Luke uses that and Paul uses it, it's a word that's more, it, it's actually about sharing, participating, contributing. It's being like fully engaged. The that's why I think Eugene Peterson has struck gold in his translation. It's not just fellowship. You know, you're, I love the fellowship. You know, like a ship and there's a bunch of fellows on it going from there to there. Well, <laughs> that word today doesn't have a lot of rich meaning, but the Greek word ginonia means sharing my life with you, participating together for the cause of the kingdom. It's being involved, connected. So he says here, the life together. It's a habit. They committed themselves with all their heart. Again, the, the original Greek basically says fully devoted in their hearts to submit to the teaching of the word, doing life together, both in large groups and small groups. The common meal, again, it's a little bit vague what Luke is saying, but we think it's the Lord's Supper, in other words, worship environment, but also eating together in homes. And I think, isn't that interesting, that worshipping Jesus, taking the Lord's Supper, and eating together is integrated. So the spiritual and the relational. And he's, he's focusing on that worship can't be separated from connection with people. The more connected you are with Jesus, the more you want to be connected with people horizontally. So the common meal and the prayers. Luke is saying that these first Christians remained ablaze in their love for Jesus because they wholeheartedly devoted themselves to these four key spiritual disciplines. And these practices fueled their faith. It was like, now that they're firm in the faith and stabilised, repentance, water baptism, baptism in the Spirit, now this is adding rocket fuel. 
This is, this is making sure they stay in orbit <laughs> and don't come down, that they, they keep breaking the gravitational pull. So what started as a raging fire didn't die down to a mere flicker over time. And sometimes I see people and I think, have they repented? Yep. Have they baptised in water? Yep. They're baptised in the spirit. But like, where's the fire? And they're on fire in those first few months, the first few years. And then I think they just seem to be, I think, where's the fire? Oh, there's a little ember there. It's just glowing. That glow has got to be oxygenated. You've got to let the oxygen of God so that it becomes a fire. And these four habits, Bible reading, application, connecting together, the Lord's Supper and, and eating and fellowshipping together and prayers are the things that will fuel those embers so that it becomes a raging fire. So you can be on fire for 47 years in the faith. I'm still on fire. I'm dangerous to be around. I start fires, wildfires. It's true. You can be ablaze for God. You might say, how is that possible? By grabbing, by being devoted to these four habits and build them into your life in the midst of all the activity around them. And listen, these people were busy. Don't say to me, oh, Pastor Bill, oh, oh, I'm too busy to come to church. I'm too busy to be involved in a small group. I'm too busy for... These people were busy, and it was in a dangerous environment. You had 3,000 of them who believed, who had come from other countries, all over the world. And they're now in Jerusalem. They've got no job. They've got no house. They've run out of money, because they've got enough money for rental and food for the festival, but they got saved. These are Jews visiting Jerusalem. So they can't go back, because they think, man, we're going to get killed. God, we're we're going to be persecuted. Like, so they stayed in Jerusalem. And the other Christians, who were the Hebraic Christians, who were born in Jerusalem and Judea, they had to look after them. And then there was these marauding maniacs who wanted to beat them up and persecute them. So they, they had killed Jesus. And, that, and so you, you, soon afterwards they started killing other Christians. So it was a very unsafe environment. So there's a lot of hiding, a lot of uncertainty. But they were still bold in their faith. And so th 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 they were busy. There was a lot of activity just to maintain that group. You imagine just feeding them, bedding them, <laughs> looking after them, uh, supplying their needs. And so in the midst of all their busyness, these brand new believers, and what a message for us, they set aside time to learn, fellowship, worship, and prayer, the big four. You can put them up on the screen, guys. Learning, fellowship, worship, prayer. What I see here is that the posture of their hearts was kept in close proximity to Jesus. And this is the only way you can keep the posture of your heart close to Jesus, by embracing these disciplines. Not to get saved, but to make sure the fire doesn't get down to a little ember. That you remain ablaze for God. And they gave persistent attention to these critical disciplines. It was like they were in a spiritual glass house. You all know what glass houses are like. I lived with glass houses. My dad was a market gardener. And I remember as a little boy, probably younger than you kids, that dad would put all the tomatoes down and cabbages and carrots, and then a frost would come in the middle of winter, shoo, you just wipe them all out. The whole crop's gone. So he decided to build more glass. So every nook and cr every part of that four acre property at uh, Brooklyn Park, he put glass houses in there. And he used to put little fires when it would get cold inside. And then he would, so, so that the light that would come would be trapped, the heat would be trapped. He'd water every plant, he'd take out every weed, he'd put superphosphate stuff there. And you know what, those tomatoes when they grew, you see little tomatoes now, they're about this big. Aren't they hopeless? Our tomatoes were this big. <laughs> I mean, you could have a meal for a week on those tomatoes. That's what they looked like to me. I mean, it was a hot house, and it grew rapid, and that grew really quick. One day they're this big, then they're this big. Then they're green, yellow, then red. This is the kind of environment that you will build around yourself when you embrace these four disciplines. You will grow. You will mature. You're going to get on fire. 
You might think, oh, I'm away. There's a little ember there. If a little ember, let's oxygenate it. Let's put some air into the thing. Let's feed it and you will see. You will grow enormously. Luke is being really clear here to us that the evidence of true conversion is a full-on devotion to Jesus and a wholehearted commitment to a local church. They're inseparable. Inse believing and belonging go together. It's like, right? And in fact, sometimes the belonging occurred first before they believed. So New Testament Christianity is community-oriented. It's the we, not me. It's the us, not I. And oftentimes, in that community of, of a sense of belonging, people sometimes take time. So I, I belonged to the church in Sturt Street for six months before I believed. I was being discipled on a Sunday as a pagan. I learned about singing. I learned about preaching. I learned about tithing. I learned about good behavior. So I'm, I'm listening. So the moment a person comes through these doors, they're starting to be discipled. And then by the love and the care, particularly by David Hersey, who was my mentor, his love and his concern and his care was just brilliant. And I say this respectfully, David and I were opposites. I had hair down to here, peace badges, pretty wild, smoking, on drugs, you know, all, all that stuff you shouldn't do. And I still remember going to church and my breath would stink of tobacco. I was like a chimney. I said, like, how do you clean that? I supposed to get all these sprays because I was so embarrassed that, he, that if he smelt it, this holy man would be infected <laughs> by my sin. I said, he was such a holy man. I'm, I'm spraying my mouth and, you know, just making sure that, that when I was there, I would never smoke at church. Like, no way. But today, I'm being discipled by the power of his testimony, his love, his concern, by the preaching of the word. So I'm actually, I'm belonging to this family before I actually believed. Isn't that interesting? We think discipleship starts after you make a commitment. No, 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 no. We, we're discipling. You can disciple your community by how you live, by how you conduct yourself. They should know what it's like to live a Christian life by watching you and observing you. So believing and belonging go together. Now, a new beginning, the three, repentance, water baptism, baptism of the Spirit, a new sense of, of, of community, a new devotion was learning, fellowship, worship, prayer. What are the results? Now, you've got to understand Luke. He, he gives us, in this passage, people don't get this. Luke was not there on the day of Pentecost. We don't know about him until Acts chapter 16, when he joined Paul's missionary journey as a medical doctor and a Christian. He's a Greek man. He joins the team in a place called Troas, Troy. I saw the beginning of the film Troy last night, and, and, and uh, Troy's a real place. So there, Troas was ancient Troy. And that's where, where Luke joined, because we know, because when you read the book of Acts, from then on it's always we, 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 we did this, whereas before it was Paul and his companions. Do you know how many years after the day of Pentecost? I think 27 years. Scholars, you'll correct me on this one. Don't write me letters. So 25 to 30 years. The day of Pentecost, 27 years later, so my apologies, it was 27 years later when Paul was put in prison in Caesarea. But it's a long time. So when did Luke do his research for his gospel and the book of Acts? Probably when Paul was in prison in Caesarea, which is the, the capital of, of Roman Judea, Palestine. So he's in prison there for two and a half to three years. Where he has all these interviews with Governor Festus and Felix and King Agrippa. And, and then he goes two years in prison, three years in prison in, in Rome under house guard. And, and then he's out for a while, then he's back in prison. So Paul spent a lot, many years in prison, probably three, six, maybe seven or eight years in prison. Different forms of, of, uh, of prison. So we think, scholars think, at Caesarea is where he's in Palestine, not in Rome. Well, what's he going to do with his time? He can't just hang around the prison. That's when he did all these interviews. That's where he found Mary. So Mary would have been, so we think it's about 27 years since. Mary would have been probably 75, 33 years, Jesus. Another 27 years, and she was 16. Probably about 75 years old. So he interviews her. He's a doctor. He gets her to open up what, what Matthew and John and Mark couldn't. 
She kept all these things to her heart in, in secret, but she shares them with the good doctor. You know, a good doctor can get you to open up. And how are you today? You're feeling all right. Let's talk a little bit. You know, if you have a grouchy doctor, you close up. You've got a nice doctor, like a pastor. If you have a good pastor, you open up. You have a good doctor. So, so the good doctor opened her up, and she shares her heart. So in Luke's gospel, you see what Mary's thinking when she's only a teenager, and she's pregnant with, with the Son of God. He did the same with the people that were there on the day of Pentecost. He said, well, what was it like? Tell me about it. He's frightened down. He's a, and so some of them would have said, well, you know, we don't know what was happening. We're on our face before Jesus. And, and it seemed like a hurricane came into the room. Luke goes, well, a hurricane? That's not possible. Then after the Spirit came, it was like flames. I saw flames on people's heads. Well, Luke's trying to write this down. Actually, he's very careful. He's a scholar. He says, it seemed like flames. See, when I got baptised in the Holy Spirit, I felt heat. Four o'clock in the morning, going right through me. I felt it. Other people feel cold. Some people shake. Some people fall over. Some people laugh. Some people cry. That's just all phys physiological response to the presence and power of God. I think Luke is saying to us, something big happened. Something powerful happened when the Spirit came. So he, re he records this in Acts chapter 2. And then he says, what was Peter's sermon like? Well, yeah, well, actually he said this and he used that scripture. And so he records accurately. And he's regarded as one of the most accurate historians of antiquity. Brilliant. And he's the best storyteller you can find. He's able to encapsulate in three sentences an image that paints a picture that's better than the best movie you've seen. His shipwreck story, when Paul, is, they reckon is one of the best shipwreck stories ever written. You read it. I mean, you're there. Like you're with Paul and the wind is going, it's like just in a few verses. So people who are, who are writers say, this man knows how to write. He knows how to paint a picture. Paint a picture that gets you right in. So he gets us right in here. And I think the Holy Spirit is using Dr. Luke to say, you know what? Your story, mate, your recording is going to help the Christian Family Centre in 2018. It's going to help the church forever. It's a pattern. It's the great pattern. It's what Rasek shared with me. And have a look at here, the new fruitful witness. He, des he describes the results of, of uh, these first Christians. As we read these verses, we can see the clearly observable fruit and witness of their transformed lives. Let's read this. Slowly. Everyone around was in awe. How's that? Deep reverence. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles. Miracles, healings. People's sick bodies were getting healed. Evil spirits were being cast out. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony. Dedicated unity. Have a look, they, they, holding everything in common, they sold whatever they owned and pulled their resources so that each person's need was met. They were materially generous, selfless and loving. Now notice, uh, some people read this, and when, in, in the Jesus movement when I got saved, there were a few people go, oh yeah, 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 we're, we're, we're Christian Marxists, let's sell everything and live in a commune. So they did, they sold everything, they... And I thought, live in a commune with all these people. I'm struggling to live with my mum and dad in one house. No thanks, I like my privacy. <laughs> so some, he's not saying, to take this literally. You've got to find the timeless transferable truth. That society was quite different. They needed to, 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 to pull their resources to pay for the food for 3,000 people. In fact, it grew to something like 17,500 people. The second sermon of Peter, 2,000 people got saved. That's 5,000 men. If half of them were married, that's another 2,500 women. If they had four kids each, like no contraception in those days, just say four kids, average, 17,500 people I've worked out. I mean, it's a big church. It's a, it's a super large, it's a mega church. And so, so that's why they had to, to find a way to feed people. We're in a different context, but the principle is here. Be materially generous, selfless and loving. Deep reverence, miraculous ministry, dedicated unity, materially generous, selfless and loving. Have a look at this one now. 
They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. You know what I see there? They were full-time Christians. Oh, they might have had careers. Farming, tradesmiths, you know, blacksmiths, teachers. They had careers, but they saw themselves as full-time Christians in their witness and living the life where they were. And they were involved in large meetings, like the temple courts were the only place that could hold thousands, and then in small groups. So the church must grow, must grow smaller as it gets larger. The church, as, as it, large and small groups, are so, so important. We see this here. They were joyful, authentic, and hospitable. Have a look at this. Every, every meal or celebration, exuberant and joy as they praise God. You see, their praising of God and their connecting with each other is linked. Praising God. They were dependent. See, when you're praising God continually, it means that you're trusting him. When you're thankful to God, you're being dependent on him. You're trusting him in all things, and it was a difficult environment. And they were respected by those outside the faith. Every day their number, so, so people in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added those who were being saved, new people being one to Jesus and joining the church. What a, what a beautiful picture. Respected by those outside the faith. Outside of the four walls here, our church is so deeply respected by the community. Amazingly so. Why? Because of, we endeavour to do good deeds. We had two government ministers here last week and the mayor and they gave us 50,000 bucks for the part of the air conditioning cost for the hall because it's used for community use. And, uh, and they'd heard of the church. In fact, they'd been here to different events. And when we filled them in a little bit on the scope of what we do, you could, you could see them go, oh, wow, yeah, yeah, we know. So the church has got a good reputation. The government's not going to give thousands of dollars to a tin pot group that's wacko in some areas or hurtful towards people. They're not stupid. What about your neighbours? When they look at you, do they like you? Do your neighbours really like you or do they hate you? If they hate you, it's not their fault. You can't have all your neighbours hating you. Something's wrong. <laughs> so, you, you know, you've got to add value to your neighbourhood. I think my neighbours like me. They think Kathy's a bit dodgy, but they like me. <laughs> that woke her up. <laughs> and some of them live lifestyles that are far removed from being Christian lifestyles. But you've got to love them. You've got to love people who think differently to you, speak differently and act differently. doesn't mean you have to agree with them. So here it says that Every day, it says people in general liked what they saw. And notice it's every day their number grew as God added those who were being saved. This is a beautiful environment. You know, for us as a Christian family centre, as a church, we are one church here. And we've, right now, our other lead pastors of our churches right across Australia, from Hobart to Alice Springs, are speaking the same message. We've got the one theme. I've given them the manuscript of my message before it's printed and we're all preaching the same thing and, uh, and they're, they're, they're doing the same thing. They're using their own stories, obviously, and outworking it their way and they're like hell. And uh, I'm thrilled that we can do some of those things together. But here at Seton, we're one church, but over the past 12 months, two years, we have recognised a reality. And I've been thinking and praying about this for, for a couple of years. I've, I've seen... That is before we used to have, we have different services. But you know right now we have actually not just four services, 8.30, 10.30, 6pm, 11 o'clock Friday. We actually have four congregations. They've actually evolved into their own identity as being part of the same church. Um, and we've recognised this. So most people attend one of the four. There's some crossover. For example, 11 a.m. On, on Friday, some of those senior folks come here to our 10.30 service. Uh, there are some people who, who perhaps can't come to church on a Sunday morning that will come Sunday night. I just think you've got to, you've got to attend a gathering once a week where it's corporate. That's the normal Christian life. You can't be here in the morning, come at night. If you can't be here at night, come in the morning. So we say that most people now are committing to one congregation and we've worked that out just through your connect cards and observation and that's just the reality we've recognized that folks we want to lean into this big time 
this evolving reality, so that every one of our corrugations can better outwork the Acts 2 model. And, uh, you know, the, to better align ourselves to the Acts 2 model of what I'm saying. And, and it's so important for all of us to be participating in, and being connected members who carry the vision of the Christian Family Centre. And today we're actually recognising and praying, we've recognised that, that we want to, to recognise teams that will actually run each of the services. And so uh, Mick Hutchfield, who oversees the Friday service, he has an assistant pastor in Alan Steele and he's building a team. And I've just, I've, I, I did this message, uh, last week's message I've done four times. Last Sunday, three times, and then on Friday morning. And it is a corrugation. It's actually quite powerful. And uh, there's, a team, there's hospitality, there's, you know, his, his team is having, they have meals every time. So it was a lovely meal, actually. Um, almost as good as what we have here on Sundays. <laughs> I think that's a Mick Hutchfield comment. <laughs> and uh, so we're recognising that and saying, you know what, that service is going to grow. That, that room's too, too small, so we think it's going to grow and develop. Our 8.30 service uh, is growing and developing, and we've asked Pastor Nathan Betcher, and in fact God has really moved on his heart, that Nathan is one of our pastors, really says, you know what, I'd like to champion that 8.30 service and, and to see the team, and so he's going to be recognised as our congregation pastor for 8.30. And uh, Cass Tompich is being recognised as our congregation pastor for 10.30. And there's about another 15 pastors around her because <laughs> the largest. And then uh, Sam Chesser, who we prayed for last week, and he's now full-time. He's had a week full-time in ministry with us. He's youth, young adults pastor, and he's overseeing the 6 o'clock congregation. And these guys and girls are building the teams so that we can do Acts 2 better. Now, we're doing one preaching theme, so we're changing it. So this theme, all of our preaching themes will be the same. It'll be the same message at each one of the four services, but different preachers. When I'm in town, I might do all four. That's my prerogative as, as the senior minister, and, I, and my voice needs to be heard, obviously, but we're doing synopsis so that, let's say, uh, when Tim next week preaches at all three messages, we've already got the themes worked out. When Sam and Alan do it on Friday, we, we, we're on the same page, the same message that God is giving to all of the church, so because we're one church. We'd like all our connect groups to be connected into one of the congregations, obviously. So we're really excited about this because we think that uh, as they develop teams, it'll ensure that we better care for each other. Pastoral care is going to go up through the roof, I think, and more easily enfold new people into our church life. It's going to be far more organic. And we'll be seeing more people released into ministry roles and a stronger sense of belonging is going to occur, which I'm really thrilled about. So I'd like us to actually pray for our congregational pastors.